Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Samina, for that. I uh, found out some stuff about myself I didn't know there, so that was, uh, that was great. Um, and thank you very much, too, for Claire and Alex for your, for your presentation there. Learned a lot, and I'm a little bit hesitant about following Paul Burnell in any, in any debate, so uh, thanks, thank, you, thank you for Paul for, for your presentation. And thanks for all of you for your insight. Um, for those of you fortunate enough, fortunate enough not to have met me, my name is Clive Thornley. I'm one of the founders and the managing director of Stein Industrial Refrigeration, and we are part of the Stein Group. Uh, as you can see by the, the, the slide up there, we've got several strings to our bow. And as Samina said, we've, what we've tried to do is challenge the way that, that, that everyone in this room thinks about the way they interact and do business with their their site energy consumption and their site refrigeration systems. So when I was sitting in my garden trying to decide what I was going to talk about this morning, I, um, I decided to draw upon the, uh, the, the Cold Chain 2023 report for inspiration. Now I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with it as it was compiled anonymously using responses uh, from, from all of us here today. So as a result, I thought it was something we should take seriously. Now I'm going to refer to a couple of slides that I think speaks volumes for the industry, its position and its view on itself. We don't seem to have... okay. So it's been identified that the two biggest opportunities for the sector are the opportunity to drive down costs as well as the opportunity to respond to demand for more sustainable cold chain logistics services. Now it's already been mentioned about in previous uh, presentations this morning about innovation and inflation being big challenges. These are obviously compiled in 2023, so um, we're a little bit behind the curve in our, in, our, in our thinking here, but nonetheless, it was, it was put forward by you guys. So I think it's important to pause a second here and think what these two, these two critical statements might mean, 68% and 62%, they're quite high numbers. Again, referring to the Cold Chain 23 report, and I know Paul touched on it earlier, there are over 40 million cubic metres of cold storage space in the UK. And pretty much without exception, I think they've all got a static refrigeration system of one, system, one sort or another. In my experience, and consulting the Stein Industrial Refrigeration Crystal Ball for a second, the average store allocates between 35 and 60% of its running cost to its electricity bill. And my crystal ball tells me even further that around 80% of that cost will be taken up by running your static refrigeration plant. So that in turn makes me think that we, our sector, feel that one of the biggest opportunities to improve the sector is to do something about the static refrigeration system installed in our buildings. It's quite a high priority. Now read again, reading through this rather marvellous source of material for this particular part of the event, I found myself on page six, which deals with the, the biggest challenge as the industry store facing the industry. Doesn't seem to want to change. Okay. You can see them listed here. Takes a second to come on. Now, this wasn't really a surprise to me when it came out, because it just isn't. Um, but to see quite how important the cost of energy and the, the concerns of energy and fuel are on everyone's agenda was a bit of a surprise. I think 18 months ago we had no drivers, no staff, and I suspect the biggest challenge would have been labour shortage. But with typical resilience, again, a word we've heard more than one occasion today, the sector has overcome that challenge. However, Irrespective of resourcefulness, the increasing cost of power, almost 90% in the last six years, means that the industry is having to consider how to use less power or use what it gets more wisely. Now, as I see it, each facility has three reasonable options in relation to its static refrigeration plant. Number one, this is going to come as a shock to you, you could just turn it off. So, if you do that, it will use less power. If it's, in fact, most things use less power when they're switched off. Some of you already do that on a limited basis to avoid peak loads and to avoid uh, times of the day when there's increased cost in using power. Now this might save money, but arguably it doesn't use much less power. 
as when you turn the system back on again, it has to work quite hard to get back to where it was before you turned it off. So turning it off isn't really a long-term answer, particularly if you're trying to main, maintain a, a, a frozen environment in your cold store. Second option you got is get it working more efficiently. Again, most facilities have a good quality service provider. Stein Industrial Refrigeration is one of those. And they're using that service provider to maintain your refrigeration system. Now, getting your refrigeration system, even an old one, running efficiently will save you both power and money. But there comes a time in the life of any equipment where it becomes either unsustainable or fundamentally uneconomic to keep it going. Third choice, as I see it, change it for something more energy efficient. Technology is a habit of moving on quickly. And in the current climate, there are a lot of, a lot of solutions available to help people like you reduce their, their electricity bills. Now again, I'm going to refer back to the Cold Chain 23 report and bring up a slide that will perhaps have an impact on what that means. Now this is page 19 of the rather splendid Cold Chain 23 report. And as some of you have already deduced from looking at it, the sector's doing reasonably well at reducing emissions. Uh, the blue lines are the government targets, and the red lines are actually what the cold chain, what the, what the cold chain achieved. So you can see 2015, 2016, government target was 7.8%, our performance 12.5%. Well done everybody, really good going. Same pattern continues right the way forward to 21, 22 where the government target was 6.7, but actually the cold chain only managed 6.8. Still exceeded target, well done everybody, but what does that mean? That, ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, means that the sector has done all the easy bits. All the low-hanging fruit, if you like. All the stuff that like fitting, fitting LED lights, it's, it's standard practice across the industry, well done for doing it all, it's made a difference to our carbon footprint. Smart lighting turning it off. Yeah, it's, it's been fitted and it's proven to be highly successful. Rapid action doors, closing doors, always a winner with a cold store, and defro installing defrost on demand systems. All of these things, whilst admirable, have only reduced the amount of power consumption by marginal amounts every time. Incremental gains. The next bit of work to reduce emissions and make the whole thing more sustainable isn't going to be as easy as changing a light switch or, or switching your refrigeration compressor off for a few hours. It's going to mean some out-of-the-box thinking and some investment in the business. So what are the options? Well, as always, there's multiple options to, and solutions to any challenge. And most cold, cold storage facilities have a significant roof area available, to them, available. And this tends to lend itself to a solar PV installation. Just as an aside, my colleagues from Steinnet Zero will be happy to handle any queries you might have around solar PV. They're, they're moving amongst you today. It's not my field of expertise, but they're rather good at it. And as I understand it, they have a solution to some known issues surrounding the use of solar PV on cold stores. Solar PV is a true renewable energy source. And coupled with battery storage, has the potential to significantly impact on any site's grid power consumption. But... With only 48% of the annual hours being daylight hours, then PV clearly has limitations on use. So clearly, we need to consider some sort of battery storage to make this option viable for an off-grid targeted site. That's assuming we can install enough solar PV panels on the roof of your building to make the whole thing viable. So what's my magic solution to this, to this issue? So today, I want to talk to you about the possibility and the theory of absorption chilling. Now, absorption chilling isn't a new idea. It was, uh, in fact, first developed by a couple of Swiss scientists in 1922. And Albert Einstein and Leo Zillard refined and improved the process between 1926 and 1933. So it's by a long way not a new idea. Since 1933, things have changed very, very little. So how does it work? Well, I'm not going to go into lots and lots of chapter and verse about absorption chiller operation. Fundamentally, because it's, um, it's quite technical and, and it's a little bit boring. We've had some concise speakers here today and I don't want to be one of those ones that's not. So I won't bore you with lots of technical detail that will put you to sleep, but I will give you the basics. An absorption refrigeration system needs heat. 
in the same way that a standard vapour compression system needs electrical power. Once it has that heat, refrigeration magic happens inside the system and the end result is refrigerated liquid in one form or another. Now that could be glycol at minus 10 degrees or ammonia at minus 35 degrees. And the system produces this without the need for lots of expensive electricity. In fact, an absorption chiller will use roughly 90% less electricity than your regular refrigeration system. That's 90% less. It's a very big number to see drastically reduce. The fact, we can re the fact that we can reduce the overall power consumption and so dramatically on every site these units get installed, is, installed on is something I want to talk about in a bit more detail. The first and most obvious question about this technology is, what's the catch? It seems almost too good to be true. Well, I'm not sure that it is. Um, the system needs a heat source, and, and that's pretty much it. So where do we get the heat from, I hear you all thinking. So there's a number of options here. Firstly, the UK industrial process as a whole wastes around 391,000 gigawatt hours of heat annually. So there's quite possibly heat going to waste on a site near yours right now. But I'm going to revisit this figure a little bit later. Secondly, your business could install a combined heat and power plant. At this moment, that would typically use natural gas as a fuel and generate power for site. The excess heat from the process could be used to run the absorption chilling process. Thirdly, your business could install a biomass boiler or a pyrolyzation plant and use the heat from those from those processes to power the absorption chiller. So let's look at how we might go about looking at the best way to, to, to use that heat. We will look at the, uh, the electricity data for your site. We'd come to site, look at your half hour data for the last year. Then we take a look at your uh, refrigeration system and look at its running conditions. And our aim will be to replace the base load, the, uh, the stuff you see at the bottom of the line here, um, with an absorb refrigeration system that's driven with a heat driven absorption system. Your base load is what's used 24 seven. And it's the expensive part in terms of power consumption and machinery wear. It's the bit that costs you most about your refrigeration process. Then we size the heat source to produce enough heat to run an absorption chiller large enough to cover that base load. Anything over your base load would be taken up by your regular refrigeration plant in the same way that it does today. So your peaks, your blast freezer startup, etc., will be taken up in the usual way. And when they're not, the plant just simply sits in standby no mode and uses little or no power, i.e. you've turned it off. The absorption chiller, however, with its no moving parts and its heat source continues to run as it's dealing with the base load constantly. So where do we get the heat from is a question I can almost hear all of you thinking. As I touched on earlier, three obvious identifiable sources as I see it. Biomass and pyrolyzation, um, I'm sure everybody's familiar to an extent with, with, with at least one of those. They're true carbon reduction systems. They generate a lot of heat for our industry. Um, we have ex experience of running an absorption chiller on, on wood chip uh, from a biomass boiler. The challenge around biomass and pyrolyzation is its inability to generate usable power for the rest of the site efficiently. So whilst it really does help with the cost of power consumed, it does not help much with the cost of power purchased from the grid. As I mentioned earlier, the UK industrial process wastes 391,000 gigawatt hours of heat annually. That is a very significant number. So it's possible there is a facility close to your cold storage facility that's wasting heat right now. We've done some feasibility studies on an industrial site where there's a waste incinerator um, that has a massive heat dump and that's got a frozen facility and a chill facility running within 300 metres of it. It's not beyond the realms of possibility to think about pumping hot water from the incinerator to the absorption chiller to run it for next to nothing. The difference with that particular solution is that we could then size the absorption chiller to do the whole site, not just, not just the base load. Third option, as I see it, is install a combined heat and power plant to generate electricity and produce heat. And I know there are a few of you in here that have already got these units powering your site. 
Until the advent of absorption chilling using ammonia in the UK, the use of CHP, combined heat and power, had limited feasibility in the third party logistics center sector, as a CHP plant produces more heat than it does power. And without an absorption chiller, most users in this sector don't have a use for all of that heat. An absorption chiller takes the heat and turns it into exactly what your business needs, a refrigerated fluid. So there'll be those amongst you that say, hang on a second, these things use natural gas and that's a fossil fuel. And despite what Grant Shapps says, burning natural gas is harmful to the environment. So here's a few facts that I'm happy to sit down and debate with anybody over lunch or dinner tonight and a glass of wine, whatever comes. So there's three things. Unless it's a particularly sunny or a particularly windy day, the UK currently uses natural gas to generate between 40 and 60% of its power. And that's not really about the change. We can't get anybody interested in building offshore wind farms. That much became obvious last week. And it takes 12 plus years to build and commission a nuclear power plant. So the drive to decarbonise our electricity grid, which if you believe the current government should be complete by 2050, has got some real, real, real big challenges ahead of it. So to burn the natural gas to produce the power to industry, at the moment, produces 265 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour because the electricity generators don't capture the heat. By capturing the heat and using an absorption chiller, the CHP plant will produce 185 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. The UK carbon footprint is reduced by using gas-fired CHP and absorption chiller technology. This is incidentally reflecting the climate, claim, climate change levy payments that you, you would receive by using CHP and absorption chilling because your CHP instantly becomes more than 80% efficient. So it, it, it reduces your climate change levy payments accordingly. Now none of these options are cheap to install, but if you think back to my fourth slide around relative improvements, this is the sort of step we will need to be considering if we're to make the leap to decarbonise our grid in time. My final slide, and I expect you're pleased to hear that. My final slide looks at the financial advantage of running an ammonia absorption system over a conventional synthetic refrigerant unit running at minus 10. An absorption chiller will currently operate, comfortably operate at much colder temperatures, but I'm using this simply for an illustration. As I said at the beginning, I don't want to get immersed in technical details. The rest of the Stein team and some of our friends from Zudeck are here today to talk about technicalities. So I'm not going to spend hours talking about this, but it's very self-evident from this slide. A 400 kilowatt, a 400 kilowatt unit, unit, unit using a synthetic refrigerant will produce around 2.22 kilowatts of refrigeration duty for every kilowatt hour of electrical power. An absorption chiller in the same condition will produce 20. It's food for thought. And as always, there's still the day job to think about. We've all still got to eat at the end of the day, and this room is instrumental in making sure that happens. So from the man in the street, thank you all for your efforts and professionalisms. I'm gonna wrap up now, um, and I've got, I'm here for the rest of the event. We've had some sessions going on in the energy zone this afternoon, uh, which were very lively last year, and I'm sure will be interesting again this year. My colleagues from the rest of the Stein Group and from Zudek will be moving around amongst you during the course of the day, so they will answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for your time.